First, I'd like to welcome everyone to a critical conversation on affordable care in North Carolina. My name is Peggy Wheel. I'm the advocacy coordinator for Western North Carolina AIDS Project, and I want to thank everyone for being here. Our elected officials have enacted legislation to prevent the expansion of Medicaid and the establishment of a state-based health insurance exchange. This decision affects people's lives in our community and our economy. Tonight, we have before us a panel of experts in improving access to health care in North Carolina. They are going to outline the consequences of not expanding Medicaid and the opportunities available with the Federal Insurance Exchange, now called the Marketplace. I would like to begin by introducing our moderator, Jacqueline Kiger. Jacqueline is a staff attorney with Fiscal Legal Services. Her legal work is concentrated in public benefits law, and as part of the 17 attorney advocate team at PLS, she works to respond to the poverty law needs of low-income residents of Western North Carolina. Jacqueline. actually know a lot about it, maybe, and probably some of you know more about it than I do. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, and I and um, when we were talking about this um, event, I, I told Peggy that I thought it would be good to make sure everyone is aware of what we will have in North Carolina, despite what um, was done in Raleigh, um, that we will have insurance, come, new insurance options coming into North Carolina, and I want to share some about that in uh, hopefully not too much detail. Uh, but I think it's important to have a sense about how this all works and how it, it may or may not uh, work well for all uh, individuals. So um, one thing I always do when I do this talk is I like to kind of see where people are. So I'm going to ask you if you would give yourself a grade on your knowledge level about the Affordable Care Act and insurance. And, and it's, you don't have to be ashamed because this just helps me know what the audience is. So if you would give yourself an A because you are pretty much in the weeds and understand all this, raise your hand if you think you have, you're an A. Okay, good. How about a B? You're, you know pretty good. Okay. Uh, C? Okay. And I, I won't ask the D, the other folks. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, so sounds like most of you have had some um, knowledge, and so I won't try to uh, get too far, um, uh, go get into too much detail or uh, be too general. So you all know kind of the basic idea of the Affordable Care Act was to cover the uninsured. 
Um, it also was um, set up to end various abuses and discrimination in healthcare, people with pre-existing conditions, people losing insurance when they get sick, all those things you know about and probably care about if you came out tonight to this um, uh, presentation. Uh, also, there are uh, things in the Affordable Care Act to encourage preventative care, um, to expand the healthcare workforce, and to increase capacity in community health centers. So it's more than just expanding coverage, but that I think the coverage expansion is the piece that we're going to focus on tonight. So just the general concept um, of the Affordable Care Act is that if you want to bring everyone into the system, right, if you need to get the sick people in, you need to get the well people in because you, your pool needs to be big to spread out your risk. And that's um, what the, the law attempted to do. And it does it in a couple of ways. As you know, the much touted individual mandate, right, or the, the, the requirement of, of coverage, um, which was approved by the Supreme Court, as you know. And there are also um, requirements for employers of large employers of 50 or more to provide insurance for their employees. Um, and uh, other ways in which uh, the, that pool is dealt with is that people can't be thrown out of the pool because they get sick or because, um, or they can't, their care can't be limited by caps, which uh, for, for example, with people with HIV were huge issues and people with cancer and other conditions when they might have insurance, but it didn't do the job because it stopped paying way before they um, were finished with what they needed. Um, and the other piece is, and the part we'll really be focusing on uh, tonight is new coverage options for folks. So this is my little diagram of the sort of the idea of the ACA when it came out. Um, that come to for 2014, so over a four year period, we would end up basically with a bunch of circle, colored circles. Um, and so that we would maintain the existing structure of care. So old Medicaid, as I call it, the existing Medicaid program would stay there. Medicare would stay there. Our VA and TRICARE systems for military and, and would stay there. Um, that we would, and we are employer insurance down there in the red, a major part of the sort of biggest way that insurance happens would stay. Um, and that we would really add two new pieces to this mix. That we would have what I've called new Medicaid, which is a, basically a new program that we would call the expansion, but is a really a separate um, program that would extend to more people and to higher incomes. And the other, piece of, the other piece of it was to bring in an insurance marketplace where people could buy insurance even if they had pre-existing conditions and where um, people would not pay more because they were female or um, because, wouldn't pay too, too much more because they were old um, or because of age and, so, and where there would be subsidies to make this all affordable. And the one piece you'll see down on the bottom where it says uninsured, um, the model always was, it, there was always a, as part of this model that there would be some folks remaining insured. And as you probably know, a big group, one of the main groups of those is undocumented immigrants who get zip, zero, nada out of the um, Affordable Care Act. Um, and so there, would, there are safety net um, uh, providers and programs that will still need to be there. For example, the Ryan White program for people with HIV, community health centers, free clinics, still will be part of the mix. So this was the idea. Um, some other folks had some other ideas. Um, the Supreme Court had its ideas. It said, to our surprise, okay, mandate, check, that's okay. Um, but very su surprisingly, and no one thought this would happen, they said, uh-uh, as a law, matter of constitutional law, expanding Medicaid, making the states do that was too coercive, so it's, it becomes an option. And so you know what, you're here probably because you know what option our state has taken. Um, and basically our governor and legislator's idea was that we would say no to everything. And as the, the bill, the Senate bill was titled, No North Carolina Insurance Exchange, No Medicaid Expansion, or as I call it, the no bill. It's just the just say no to Obamacare bill. Um, and I tried to find the most unflattering pictures of the perpetrators <laughs> I could on the, on the internet. So, okay, so that's where we're at. And, and it can be, it kind of feel like a bummer to get there. 
But uh, we, we have something really big coming down the pike that really will fill, if it works, and we hope it will um, cover many of the uninsured that we have. Um, I'm going to just skip right through there. Some other components to the ACA I mentioned. Um, a lot of uh, expansion of free preventative care, so in employer-based insurance, in Medicare, that, um, that the U.S. Um, preventative health, whatever that body is, um, recommended preventative care is available for free for folks. And annual um, physicals and those kinds of preventative care um, are incentivized by not having any, any um, co-pays or cost sharing with those. There was a lot of money put into the preventative um, prevention and public health fund, some taken away, but um, and also expanded funding for community health centers, some of which has, um, I believe, also been taken away. Um, it also approves a Medicare drug plan over time, getting rid of that nasty donut hole. So there were some other aspects of, of the ACA that have been implemented, and, and the one I don't mention is up to tw the covering folks up to 26 years old on their parents' insurance. So the part that I want to um, spend a little time talking about and getting a little bit into the weeds for you is the insurance marketplace, which is coming in um, very soon. So um, you know this, most people when they think of the Senate Bill 4, um, think of the, it said no to Medicaid expansion. The other part that really burns me up is the part where they said, no, 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 no. We are against the federal government, so the federal government can run our insurance marketplace. Um, that's really interesting, but that's fine. Um, so as a result of the bill, um, in, instead of North Carolina doing what was called a partnership exchange, where they wouldn't create their own insurance marketplace, which was what the hope was in the law that states would make their own, um, when states didn't seem to be jumping at that, this, that, they offered this option of a partnership exchange, which was seemed to be the direction we were going until Senate Bill 4 came out. And um, at that point, um, all state official involvement um, is, is over for now. There, there's the Department of Insurance still will be doing a lot of their regular job around insurance. But one of the most um, disappointing parts of it is um, that there was money that they had been awarded, $74 million. Uh, a large part of that, I think it was $23 million, um, it was for consumer assistance, and they had a really um, great program of consumer assistance to help people. Uh, and as you can see, the number is you know, an estimate of 700,000 folks that need to get insurance through this new marketplace. Um, they're going to need help getting there, and so um, it's really sad that the bill basically said, no, we're, we're turning this money back um, for uh, a really, uh, what would have been a really good consumer assistance um, program. So um, we're going to have to find other ways to get people informed and get them signed up for insurance. So a little bit about the marketplace. Um, if you remember in the beginning, it was called an exchange which was a kind of unfortunate term that really did not really catch on with folks. And they now have renamed it Marketplace. And um, so we're going to call it Marketplace. If I, if I slip and say exchange a couple of times, just forgive me because it's hard to get that term out of my head. But so this exchange goes live uh, January 1st, 2014. So that means there will be a marketplace where folks can buy insurance. Um, the um, open enrollment for it starts October 1st, which I believe I'm 200, around 200 such days, so coming very soon. Um, so this marketplace, just to be clear, is only for folks who don't already have access to quality, affordable insurance. So I have really great health insurance from Duke. Um, I, even if I wanted to, could not go buy in the insurance marketplace. Um, when they set this up, they didn't want to suck everybody away from employer-based insurance. So this was set up as a, an additional option for folks in really the individual insurance market. So people who either weren't, haven't been able to get insurance, maybe because they had pre-existing conditions or was too expensive, um, or they, their employers didn't offer insurance, or their employers offered really cruddy insurance that didn't really cover anything. Uh, a lot of our clients might have these little mini-med policies that really are pretty much worthless. 
Um, so folks who have that kind of coverage or who don't have any employer coverage or who for whom the coverage is too expensive. So if the employer coverage doesn't cover at least 60% of costs for an average person, the, the, the insurance wonk term for that is actuarial value, and I feel very proud of myself that I actually know what that is. Um, it, but you, all you need to know that it's basically a level of kind of how much the plan pays. So if it doesn't pay at least 60%, for an average kind of person, or if it's gonna cost, individual coverage would cost more than nine and a half percent of an employer's, employee's income, then um, in those two instances, they can not take the employer offered insurance and then go buy in the marketplace. So that's the only time someone who has insurance offered to them can bail and go to the marketplace. Um, one of the sad parts of that is there will be a lot of people who have employer-based insurance offered to them, and they really can't afford it. And unfortunately, they will not be able to get any subsidy, and they will not be able to go and buy in the marketplace if they don't meet that 9.5% requirement. So it's not perfect. Um, that, there are definitely <laughs> going to still be gaps, and there will be people who won't um, be covered. So um, sort of basics of this coverage on the marketplace, um, one of the rules is it has to cover what they call essential health benefits. Um, it's 10 categories of standard benefits that are pretty typical. Um, and they, it's, it, there's a, the figuring, sort of explaining and working out from the statute what that meant it was, it is being done through a process of kind of finding an insurance policy in the state that has those, filling that out, and then telling all the plans, well, you have to kind of match up to this plan, more or less. It's a benchmarking process, they call it. So if you ever go online and look, and look at the Blue Cross Blue Shield Blue Options plan, that's basically what the model will be. And it has a pretty basic, you know, it covers those services, you know, pretty much like a basic small employer plan. Not as rich as big employer plans, but it's, it's decent. Um, the other piece of the marketplace is that um, there are supposed to be um, requirements that essent what they call essential community providers will be in the networks that the insurance companies offer. Because you know this is this is insurance, and you know not all ins when you buy insurance, you can't necessarily go to any doctor you or provider. You have to go to the ones that are in the plans networks, and the plans consent networks. Um, and the law, the Affordable Care Act said they needed to include what they called essential community providers. So, you know, federally qualified health centers, um, Ryan White clinics, other, other types of providers like that, plan, um, family planning clinics. Um, when, it, when that standard has gotten sort of worked out um, in a federal uh, exchange like the one we're going to have, the federal marketplace where the federal government runs the whole thing, um, sadly, the standards for that are pretty low. It doesn't take much. They don't have to have every community provider in the network or even that many. So there's going to be some, you know, there may be some issues around the adequacy of the net provider networks. And that's something everybody will need to be watching as this rolls out to sort of be able to sort of see what needs to be fixed as it, as it comes out. So you've probably heard about the metal levels, and I'm not going to go into that. That just relates to the level of generosity of the plan, whether, whether you have a lot of cost sharing or whether you have a little cost sharing. And of course, you know, the higher the premium you pay, the more generous plan you buy. If you choose to go for the low premium, then you're going to have more cost sharing. Um, the specific benefits and the, how much the cost sharing is and formulary, you know, drug plans and provider networks will vary according to plans. And there will probably be a bunch of different plans that are offered in our marketplace. Um, and premiums are, are limited. So people who are sick can't be turned away, right? That was, so there's no pre-existing condition limitation for buying the insurance. And also, they can't be charged more for that, which often for, like, you know, I work with clients with HIV, yeah, they may could go and buy a plan, but it was going to cost them twelve or $1,500 a month, so it was completely unaffordable. So that kind of thing can't be taken into account in the rates. There are only really a couple of things. The two main things that can be taken into account are um, age at a much lower um, uh, I can't think of the insurance term. So they can take it into account, but not as much as they do now. 
So the, the way insurance is, is done now, people who are older pay way, way, way more than people who are younger. This kind of try to brings it in so that there's only really a, a maximum, the cheapest rates can only be, um, the, 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 sorry, the older folks can only pay a, more, a maximum of a three times more than the lower, the younger rates. So they've limited that. The other piece that really, really worries me is the tobacco piece of this. Um, which is that people who smoke can be charged up to one and a half times um, of the, the rate. Um, and, as I'll t it, and the thing that's really scary about that is that that, what, that extra little bit that they might have to pay is not, cannot get subsidy to cover it. So there could be a lot of folks who are going to be priced out by the tobacco piece. Um, well, yeah, but if they can't have insurance and get access to smoking cessation, um, that's going to that create a problem. And I know there is room for difference on this, but I think that lower income people, people with mental health issues, people with HIV smoke at 60% of people with HIV, men with HIV smoke. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to be, I, I, I worry that that will, be, that will be kind of priced out uh, on this. Okay, um, so let me talk a little bit about the financial assistance on the marketplace. So there are two ways that people can get helped on the, in, the, in the marketplace. First, there's premium tax credits, is the, is the term they use, um, that people can basically get a reduced premium on a sliding scale based on income. And that's, a, that's paid, that, that's not like you have to wait and file your taxes and then you get that money back later. It basically just reduces what you pay. So, for example, if you are at 100% of the federal poverty level or 100, even up to like 150% of the federal poverty level, you're paying 2% of your income toward premium. And whatever the difference is, the federal government's going to pick up and pay that straight to the insurance company. So you, you totally, you won't even have to touch that money ever. Um, the other, and that um, subsidy is available on a sliding scale for people from 100% of the federal poverty level up to 400. So for, uh, the federal poverty level is around 11,000, a little, little less than 11,500 right now. Um, so someone at that level to four times that level for, and I'm talking for a single person, um, would be eligible to get these premium credits. Um, the other subsidy is in the cost sharing. So, um, and that subsidy is limited to people between 100 and 250 percent of, of poverty, um, and that way it reduces um, deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, um, and also in that range, people can get a reduced um, out-of-pocket maximum. So that you, even if you have a lot of expenses, you hit a ceiling eventually, and that can be reduced to a level that's better than a lot, but still could be challenging. Um, I think about our clients, people with HIV with a lot of expensive medicines that are usually on specialty drug tiers so that even with help on the cost sharing could be um, difficult. Um, so one important limit on all of this is that, so as a result of the Medicaid expansion piece being um, eliminated, um, so let me step back. So the whole concept of the Affordable Care Act was you got you got people at 133 and below percent of the federal poverty level and below would be in Medicaid expansion. People from 100 and up to uh, above could could would be eligible for the insurance. There's a little overlap in there. Um, but when, so when they designed the law, they didn't provide for any subsidies for people below the federal poverty level. It just, it wasn't, you know, the concept was those people would be on Medicaid, right? Um, so when the Medicaid expansion was uh, elimin eliminated in our state, um, when the Supreme Court said, you know, they'd have to do it, we are left with a whole group of people that are at 100% of the federal poverty level and below are not eligible for any subsidies in the insurance marketplace. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so this is this like a surprise. So this is the double whammy of not expanding Medicaid because there's nothing for those folks. Well, so the current Medicaid, old Medicaid, thanks, that's a good question. Current Medicaid 
Um, it varies from state to state, but in North Carolina, the, the thing about Medicaid is you have to fit into a category to get it. You have to be like a child or a parent or disabled, those pregnant women, breast cancer, there's a number of categories. The income threshold, say for a disabled person, is 100% of the federal poverty level, right? So, um, but if you're not in that category, you can't get it at all. So, for example, if you have HIV, but you are not disabled by federal rules, like i.e. unable to work, um, so if you're just you're not a, if you're able to work and you have HIV, you cannot get Medicaid, even no matter how poor you are. Um, fortunately, we have AIDS Drug Assistance Program, we have Ryan White Program to, to help you know fill in for those folks, but you can't get Medicaid. Or if you have cancer and you're not at the point of being disabled, you don't get Medicaid. And so it's really childless adults who are not disabled are the folks who are really left out of the current Medicaid program. Not to mention people who are in the categories that you know disabled but above the federal poverty level are, are left out of Medicaid as well. Um, and again, undocumented people um, get nothing in any of this either. So um, uh, this chart is a little bit I, I, it's a little bit hard to read, but it tries it sort of stratifies um, how this all works. So the, the main thing to look at is that the reminder that, the folks above 100% have access to subsidies at various levels, depending on where they're at. But the people at, at or below 100 without Medicaid expansion um, are out, left out in the cold. Um, so just to give you an idea of what the subsidies are, I've just put them on a chart here. And I know this is a little hard to read. I'm just going to just so you basically, for example, folks who are um, uh, at between 100 and 133 percent of the federal poverty level would pay two percent of their income for, for uh, a subsidy uh, for their premium. Their out-of-pocket cost sharing would be around six percent so, and a maximum out-of-pocket and this is based on a, a number that is the 2013 number and might go up would be around 2083. So no matter how much co-pays and cost sharing there would be a cap which is good it's still a lot though. If your income is, you know, if you're making $11,500 a year and you're potentially exposed to, you know, $2,000 in medical costs, this may not work for you. So even though um, the folks, people that were in, you know, Medicaid was supposed to cover 133% and below. Um, and of that group, the folks in that 100 to 133 were, are the lucky ones who still can access subsidies. The, um, but it's it's very it, it'll, it would be it'll be very difficult. An average person who doesn't have a lot of medical costs, it might work fine. For folks who are chronically ill and have a lot of expenses, a lot of expensive medicines, I, I think it's can be problematic for some. So I have a couple examples, and then I'm gonna I think this will I will be done. So I want just so you wanted you to be able to see how this works out. So my my client is Jane Smith. And her income is, uh, she's at 149% of the federal poverty level, so that means she's making about $16,000 a year. So here's how it will work out for her. So if she buys a plan on the marketplace that has a uh, retail cost of $475 a month premium. Um, no, 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 but, but wait, there's more. Okay, the next box shows us what she actually pays because she's only, because of the subsidies, she's going to get uh, a discount. So she's thank you. I'm like, I, I, you look like you're ready to have just go apoplectic over that one. I would too. Four hundred and seventy-five dollars a month. Um, so, and this is a, we don't know what the premiums will be. This is just an example that, that may not be unreasonable. So, what she would pay would be two percent of her income, which is fifty-seven dollars a month. That's not a, insignificant if you're living on that budget, but it's probably around the price of your, you know, uh, a data phone per month. Um, so it's doable to pay that kind of a premium. So for her, she this could be uh, the premiums for her insurance could be affordable. So what she the next box shows what the government will pay for her. So they would pay the remainder of her premium directly to the insurance company. Um, and the, the way that her, her setup for deductibles and co-pays would vary 
depending on whatever the plan is that's offered in this marketplace, but it, it would come to, for an average person, that the plan pays 94%, she pays 6%. 6%. And again, her maximum amount of pocket is around twenty to $2,000, a little over. So it's, it's doable. One other example I have for you is John Jones, whose income is at 300% of the federal poverty level. So um, he doesn't get the subsidy for cost sharing. He just gets the premium subsidy. The, the, the assistance with the um, cost sharing only goes up to 250% of poverty, so 100 to 250. So he's above that. But you can see, um, and, and the sliding scale chart that I showed you, he's paying 9.5% of his income for insurance. So where his monthly premium is 475, that same $475 premium, he's paying $273 of that. And the government is picking up about 200. That's still a lot on $30,000 a year. So I think there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of worry that even with the subsidies, some people may look at this and say, okay, what is my penalty for not buying insurance? $95? Hmm, I may just continue to take my chances. Um, and what I worry is that the people who will enroll will be the sick people that really need the insurance and the healthy people won't and then that, you know, that's not good. Our pool needs to have those healthy people. So you need to get all the healthy people you know to say, okay, it's worth, and, and they need to learn that it's worth buying insurance. Could, can you clarify that penalty? Yeah, so there is a, a the tax penalty that's paid. It's in the first year it's ninety five dollars, and then it goes up to three ninety five, and then Adam, help me. Do you know six something is the yeah? Okay, it goes up to like over. It goes up. To, I think the maximum is about. It goes up, but it's never more. It's like about seven hundred dollars. I mean, and it, and that will be adjusted for you know cost of living and stuff. But but even after a few years, seven hundred dollars tax penalty may not be enough to incentivize someone with this income to buy insurance, unless we all make sure that people understand why insurance matters and, and that people are, that there's enough assistance and marketing and explanation about why they why folks should have insurance. Um, Is that initial $95 per year? Yes, yes, it's just a one, one, that one year tax penalty. So it's, it's, it's not, it's a mandate, but boy, it's not much of a mandate at least in the beginning. So uh, a couple things, I stole this slide from Pam Silverman at the Institute, North Carolina Institute of Medicine, just to show you that, so how do you get this insurance? Well, basically a lot of people, it's, you're gonna, it's, it's a, supposed to be a one-stop shop. You go online, you do it, fill out an application. It'll figure out, ideally, whether you are eligible for Medicaid, even the old Medicaid, since we don't have new Medicaid. Um, and it'll go out to all the idea, and we hope this will work, is it'll go out to Homeland Security, and it'll go out to Social Security and Employment Security to verify Internal Revenue, IRS, and it'll make it'll figure all this out, what you're entitled to, and it'll come back and it'll say, dip, 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 you're eligible for this subsidy. And then you can go on, and um, if any of you looked at the Medicare Part D, website to see how you buy, you know, get up, sign up for plans, something that will probably look like that, or it's, they say like Expedia, um, uh, then uh, you'll go in and you'll be able to enroll that way. So I'm going to stop. Uh, there will be assistant, consumer assistance for this, a website, a toll-free um, number, and application counselors, but there probably won't be enough and there will be a need for all of us to encourage folks to get out and uh, buy insurance. So I'm going to stop and turn it over to the next speaker. Okay, thank you so much for that, Ms. Rice. Uh, just to let everybody know, we've got two more topics that our panelists are going to cover this evening. We're going to talk about Medicaid expansion and then answer the broader question, sort of where do we go from here, what can we do now? Um, and we also have a lot of a period of time for your participation for audience comments or questions, which we'll get to at the end of their discussion. Um, so moving forward, I'd like to now introduce our next panelist, uh, Dr. Shannon Dowler, a family physician with over 10 years practice experience in nonprofit organizations. She currently serves as the Chief Medical Officer for Blue Ridge Community Health Services, an organization that serves over 25,000 uninsured and underinsured patients. 
and an integrated medical home with uh, dental, behavioral health, and nutritional services. Um, so Dr. Dowler uh, is going to discuss Medicaid expansion with us. Thank you. tonight to join us for this conversation. I'm not used to standing still when I talk. I usually roam, so I'm going to do my best to stay near the microphone. So I'm Shannon Dowler. I am not an expert, um, certainly not at politics or policy, but I am a family doc who's taking care of uninsured patients for over 10 years, and that's really my passion in medicine. So needless to say, this is a really important topic for me. The first thing I wanted to do, because I wasn't sure exactly who my audience would be tonight, was to explain what a community health center is because I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Blue Ridge Community Health Services, which is a community health center. We also have a sister community health center located in Asheville called Western North Carolina Community Health Services, known fondly as winches um, locally. But a lot of people have some misperceptions about what community health centers are, and so I thought this would be a nice opportunity to make sure everyone was on the same page and understood what a community health center is. Basically, we're a private, nonprofit organization, so we're all run differently. So we all look a little different. We're not uh, federal employees. We're not run by the federal government. We receive grant funding, and we all receive different kinds of grant funding in different amounts in different ways. We have a patient majority board of directors, which is very unique. Um, so our patients are a big part of making our board decisions. And we also can only have 10% of our board at any time come from the medical field. So we have a very diverse uh, board. So we see all patients regardless of the ability to pay. So all community health centers have a sliding scale based on people's ability to pay and have discounted fees. Now, like I said before, different community health centers function a little bit differently. So depending on the philosophy of the community health center and the community might depend on what their sliding scale is, whether they'll see you if you don't have your copay at the time of the visit. Um, they vary widely across the country. We're particularly important to the uninsured, obviously, and those living in poverty. We do take all forms of insurance, and we get kind of excited when insured people come in, but um, our main goal to be there is to take care of the uninsured and those that we consider underinsured, which is Medicare and Medicaid traditionally. Um, so we come, our grant funding comes from a Section 330 grant, and that has a specific requirement. Pretty much we have to play well in the sandbox with others. So it's important for us to be able to collaborate with like-minded organizations. We want to reduce redundancy of services, so we don't want to have a lot of people in the community duplicating the same service. We want to instead work well together so we enhance each other's service delivery. We are the largest network of primary care providers across the whole country, and that's a pretty significant thing. There are over 1,200 grantees that have well over 8,000 sites, and part of the affordable care is actually expanding and creating new sites. So we got some dollars last year to create a new site, so we opened up a clinic in Brevard, um, and that's a new clinic, and we're looking at some other regional clinics as well. This is just a map, it's kind of hard to see this, but wherever there's color, there are patients served by community health centers, and it's, it's kind of vague on this, but most of the country is served by a community health center. When I talk to y'all tonight about Medicaid expansion, I can't help but throw out some patient stories, because as a physician, this is what makes me tick, and the patient stories are really what it's all about. You know, when we talk about legislation sometimes, we forget that these are real people with real lives that we're talking about. And I think this is especially true in this conversation. So the first patient I'm going to tell you about is a 53-year-old African-American male who walked into our clinic. He didn't have an appointment, um, but was complaining of abdominal pain and back pain. Our, um, one of our physician assistants saw him, called me into the room to examine him with her because he was a pretty sick guy. He was about 115 pounds when he walked into our office. About a year before he came to us, he had moved to the area and started having back pain. The first time he went to the emergency room it was because he had a lump in his groin, and the emergency room doctor said, I think you're all right, but follow up with the primary care doctor, which is great advice, except for he didn't have a primary care doctor. He was self-employed, he worked, he didn't have any children, so he didn't qualify for Medicaid or any other form of assistance, and he was new to the community, so he didn't really know what the resources were. Over the next year, he presented to six, he had six different emergency room visits across three different emergency rooms trying to get help. And he was sort of labeled as a drug seeker because he would frequently come in with back pain. So it was either these, his groin hurting or back pain. And so he finally landed at our door. Finally, the case manager at the emergency room said, go to Blue Ridge. Well, the day we saw him, he had a huge abdominal mass and had multiple lymph nodes. 
Um, within 48 hours, he had biopsies and imaging studies done, and he had metastatic stage 4 colon cancer. He only lived for three months after we saw him. And this is a gentleman who was a high-functioning, working member of our community. If he had had routine screening, like he should have, at 50 years of age, he would have colon had a colonoscopy. They might have found a little polyp that was precancerous, but they absolutely would have prevented this cancer. But a lot of our uninsured patients, even though even if he had a primary care home, he probably wouldn't have had that colonoscopy because to walk into the door of a GI office is usually $500 cash. And then they're going to ask for another $1,500 or $1,800 to have your colonoscopy. So most patients don't choose to follow up that preventive health route. So I'm going to give you some data just about North Carolina. And I also stole from Pam Silverman from the Institute of Medicine. So um, she's a good resource, obviously. Um, we think there are about 1.5 million uninsured in North Carolina. Um, and obviously, we know that being uninsured has some negative impacts on health. When you look at who's uninsured, actually the vast majority are non-Hispanic Caucasians. And if you look at the age range, it's pretty logical that it's in that sort of midlife spectrum. As people are older, they qualify for Medicare. When they're younger, they really qualify for Medicaid. We have a very generous Medicaid for Children program in North Carolina. Um, those that don't usually have parents that just don't know what the resources are and don't know that they can enroll them in Medicaid or they're undocumented. And that's certainly something that uh, we deal with sometimes. A lot of people have a, this impression that the uninsured are unemployed, that they're just not going to work every day. And I would argue the complete opposite is true, certainly from my perspective and my practice. Most of them are hardworking folks that just don't make enough to pay for their insurance premiums. I had a patient that worked at Bojangles, and her deductible was $5,000 a year. So she, had to, she made maybe $14,000 a year, had children. That $5,000 deductible, I mean, why even bother? So she couldn't get her diabetic supplies and a lot of the things she needed. So most of the uninsured actually work or they have a worker in the family in their home taking care of children. This question came up earlier about why did somebody not qualify for Medicaid. And this is a nice slide that shows how North Carolina Medicaid works and who qualifies and who doesn't qualify. So pregnant women, children tend to qualify. Um, the folks that don't are the working parents, non-working parents, and God forbid if you didn't reproduce. Because if you don't have children, you're not going to qualify for Medicaid. And that is a really a huge barrier for a lot of our patients. So right now, North Carolina Medicaid, which actually we have a pretty phenomenal Medicaid program in North Carolina. It's the best insurance money can buy. I mean, it's far better than my plan. Um, it is really broad coverage. But right now, we only cover 30% um, of the patients that would qualify for Medicaid. Um, so had we expanded, you can see the white area, those are all the people that would have picked up coverage. And so those are the, you know, the biggest group is the childless um, adults. So this um, is sort of reinforces what we had just covered about those folks, our poorest of the poor, the people that are living below 100% of federal poverty are the ones that are not gonna qualify for any assistance at all. And so they're probably gonna go without coverage. The next patient I wanna tell you about is a 63 year old white female who came into our office, was having regular routine primary care, had some allergies during allergy season and started uh, with this sort of nagging cough. And despite routine treatment, she didn't really respond. And so we got a chest x-ray, which was normal, and we have x-ray in our building, and so we can get it for patients very, very inexpensively. Um, and so she did have the chest x-ray and couldn't really come up with why she had this cough. So she worked uh, with chemical exposure for most of her life in her job. And so I was a little concerned and suggested we get some pulmonary function tests or at least get a specialty consult or we could just even try for a CT scan of her chest just to get a better idea of what was going on. But none of that was an option for her. She had no health insurance. So once she left our building and sort of the safety of our network, there were going to be costs associated with it. And a lot of our uninsured patients don't want to take resources from other patients or they just don't want to incur the debt and know that they're going to be beholden to another organization for money that they just don't have. And so they'll choose not to do it. So she missed her follow-up appointment with me. And the next time I saw her was about three months later. She'd gone out of town and gotten pretty sick when she was out of town, was seen in an emergency room, had um, got a bunch of steroids and antibiotics and all that. But when I saw her, she looked awful. She'd lost a bunch of weight um, and was miserable. At that point, she was sick enough that she agreed finally to have the CT scan done. Um, which showed metastatic stage four lung cancer. Um, could we have, even if we picked up her diagnosis three or four months earlier, we couldn't have prevented her lung cancer, but we could have gotten her treatment a little bit earlier. And the cost that we're now paying 
um, in Medicaid because once you have someone with advanced disease, it's much more expensive than treating them early in the course of the disease. So there are a lot of reasons why had she had Medicaid or some other benefit, she would have done better. This is a map. This comes from, anyone can go out on the um, internet and find this. It's the UDS mapper. So we're federally qualified, meaning that we get some grant money from the feds. And this may come as a surprise to everyone, but when you get money from the feds, they want you to report on a lot of things. So they actually do really good work with the information that we send them. So all the community health centers across the country have to report on tons of information every year, and they've consolidated it into this UDS mapper. So this is a map that shows our region. It's kind of smack dab in the middle um, where you see all those red dots kind of in the middle is Asheville. But since this is a regional conversation, I wanted to include counties around us. So the, the pink dot up top is Winches, we're the pink dot below. And each red dot represents 100 patients that are low income and uninsured. So despite the fact that we have over 25,000 active patients in our clinic, we've had over 80,000 visits just last year. If you look at all those red dots, and those are all the patients that aren't getting served still. So there's a tremendous need out there. This actually is a nice snapshot of incomes. This is also from the UDS mapper. And so the darker the orange, the poorer the area. And so as you would expect, as you get away from urban areas and you get more rural, you get lower incomes. And that's important when we're talking about Medicaid expansion. There is um, that one sort of like island of wealth, sort of North Asheville and South Asheville is doing fine, but kind of everywhere else is in trouble. Um, and then this, the darker the purple, is the more patients there are that are not currently being served by a community health center that are low income, low insured. So you can see the need certainly, kind of inner city, if you want to call it that, Asheville, um, there's a great need. And you only have so much capacity. So our community health centers with the funding we have can only do what we can do, but there's a tremendous amount of need. And if that Medicaid expansion had happened, if all those patients had been qualified for Medicaid, there would have, we would have been much better able to meet the need. So what is the impact on Western North Carolina? Well, 20%, one in five people that live in Western North Carolina do not have any form of health insurance at all. Um, we have over 110,000 people in Western North Carolina that would have qualified for Medicaid if we'd been able to expand Medicaid. And also our age is greater than the state and the national average, so our health outcomes are a little bit worse and the cost of health care is a little higher. How will our community be affected? So one of our partners in our community is Mayhead. Probably everybody that lives in the area has heard of Mayhek or had a doctor that was trained at Mayhek. I was trained at Mayhek. Uh, most of the family doctors in Western North Carolina and quite a few of the OBGYNs were trained at Mayhek. Mayhek's an important partner in our community for putting out primary care doctors. <coughs> the decision to not expand Medicaid is probably going to cause a reduction of a little over a million dollars for them next year that they had hoped to have to expand their services and create more services and more access. Um, the rural communities, I think, are the most hard hit, as we saw from the map that shows where the lower income is, because rural communities really would have benefited from that extra coverage. And then our critical access hospitals are really going to be in trouble. Part of what is happening with affordable care is Medicaid reimbursement to hospitals goes down. So over the next couple years, there's a projection of a significant decrease in dollars going to hospitals because, theoretically, there are more insured people, there are more people with Medicaid, so you don't have to spread out the cost of the uninsured, so they need less payment for services. Well, now that we're not going to expand Medicaid in North Carolina, our rural hospitals like Transylvania Hospital and these other rural hospitals are going to be hit very hard. A lot of these are mission-based hospitals, and mission projects over $250 million in cuts will have to happen in the next 10 years to make up for this loss. And these are real services um, to patients that are not going to be able to get them in their rural communities, and they're going to have to come into the bigger hospital setting. And then the impact of community health centers. We did some calculations of Blue Ridge in preparation for this expansion. We figured that about 11,000 of our current patients would qualify with Medicaid expansion. And if they came to our office one time in a year, all those 11,000 patients, and these are existing patients, this isn't that unmet need that we're talking about, it would have come in at a little over a million dollars of income to our organization, which we could use then to expand our workforce, hire more dentists, hire more family doctors, hire more psychiatrists so that we can have better services to provide to our patients. And we're not going to get that now, but what we are going to have is an influx of even more patients that aren't going to have access to health care. And we're actually going to have decreased funding. So in the first few years of affordable care, there's some increased funding, but there's actually a fiscal cliff that's going to happen for community health centers. 
In 2016, the federal funding is going to drop off significantly. And that's because it should. If Medicaid expansion is happening, more of your patients are insured or have some form of coverage, they don't need the federal dollars to help supplement these clinics. We should be able to run on our own. We shouldn't need that extra help. So states where Medicaid expansion is happening are going to be fine because they're going to have that income to help offset things. States like North Carolina who don't are going to be hit very hard. And our state association predicts that we'll probably have to reduce our capacity by 30% in 2016 because we're just not going to have the dollars to take care of the uninsured <coughs> care. The last patient I'm going to talk to you about is a patient that we see, unfortunately, numerous times a year. And this is probably the most tragic story I'm going to tell you because it's something that we really, um, from a public health perspective, know better and should be able to do better than we do. 50-year-old female walked into our night clinic without an appointment, had not seen primary care in a long, long time, complaining of breast pain. When the provider examined her, she had a fungating breast mass that the cancer had grown out of her chest wall. And uh, she had a biopsy done within about 48 hours of seeing us, metastatic, broad cancer throughout her body. North Carolina has a program called BCEP, which provides cervical cancer and breast cancer screening free for all women in North Carolina. And if we happen to pick up a cancer when we're doing your pap smear or doing your mammogram, you automatically qualify for Medicaid, if you're documented. You qualify for Medicaid, so you get services right away. So this is a completely preventable cancer. But probably four or five times a year in our clinic, someone walks in with a breast cancer this severe, who just had it, was self-employed, didn't understand that there were services available to them, didn't have children, so didn't qualify for any kind of extra services, and then had a terrible outcome that we really could have prevented. So um, I, I show this to my providers sometimes when they're whining about things. It says, when asked, would you rather work for change or just complain, 81% of respondents replied, do I have to pick? This is hard. <laughs> and in fact, it is hard. Um, but there are some important things that we need to do uh, moving out from now. Uh, I'm going to close with a quote from Einstein that says, learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. The important thing is not to stop questioning. And I think the fact that you're here tonight listening to this conversation, having this conversation is a, is a really hopeful and positive thing. And as we move forward, I think what we need to do um, is work on our existing programs. We have Community Care of North Carolina, which I referenced our Medicaid program earlier, that we have a fabulous Medicaid program in North Carolina. We need to show the legislature that that program is doing well, that's highly efficient, that it's producing excellent outcomes, and that we have the capacity in North Carolina to expand it. And we need, so that is our job, sort of moving forward, is to show that we have the infrastructure that we are capable of expanding, and we need to sort of work to get that message out. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Dr. Dowling. Well, that was a good lead-in for our uh, next panelist in terms of moving forward. Um, Adam Searing is going to talk now about sort of what are the next steps, where do we go from here. Um, and Adam Searing serves as the director of the Health Access Coalition for the North Carolina Justice Center. The Health Access Coalition is North Carolina's leading voice for progressive health care reforms uh, that addresses the needs of the uninsured and the underinsured. The project advocates both for more comprehensive and effective public health care programs, as well as on behalf of average consumers in the private market. Oh, come on. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, let me just start off by, um, I think we've had a, a big overview of what's happening. The main decision is that our legislature, we're going to get a health exchange, okay? We're going to have a federal health exchange. We're going to be able to access those tax credits. And by the way, I'll just say in Massachusetts, which has had one of these health exchanges for years, you've got, I think it's over 96% of people do have insurance, um, and 98 plus percent of kids have insurance. So we're, going to, we're probably going to have to adjust the tax credits, but it's working in Massachusetts. No reason why it can't work here. Uh, um, anyway, the, the main decision, though, that our legislature, legislature and our governor made was to reject the Medicaid expansion for poor people, to reject accepting this federal money, billion, $1.4 billion a year. No, we don't want it. We don't want it. We don't want that money. Here they are. 
Now, if you don't recognize some of those folks, let me tell you who they are and what they're doing. Uh, that's Governor Pat McCrory right there, and he's grinning, and he is signing the bill that said we are not going to accept that $1.4 billion a year to expand health insurance at no cost, by the way, for the, for the first three years, and then like 93% of the cost is paid for by the federal government. So he's, he's, so he's um, joined by Representative Justin Burr. Um, he's also joined by Representative Marilyn Avila, who's from Wake. And he's also joined by Representative Mark Holo, who's from Alexander Wilkes and Yadkin counties. So they are, they are unaccountably very proud that they are signing this bill. I don't know why. Even if you thought that this was necessary, and the arguments that we heard were, oh, well, one, Medicaid is broken, and oh, two, we might not get all that federal money. Who knows if we'll get it? We're, we're all about getting all the transportation money we can get, and all the education money we can get, and we're going to depend on that. But what this stuff we might not get. But even if you thought that those sad reasons were good enough to deny half a million people, poor people in this state, health care, um, why you would grin while you were signing that bill is beyond me. But they did. So uh, I, <laughs> I, I take this photo as a call to all of us who care about this issue to change this decision. Let me show you another photo. Uh, it'll, it's, it's on our website yet. Yeah. Okay, now here, here are a couple. I just took the local legislators, and I was thinking, who, who is the person in Asheville who I respect the most and who cares about families and children and, and would say, accept the Medicaid expansion? And of course, it's Dr. Olson Huff. So. Yeah. These are two, the two representatives from up here, um, Representative Fisher and Senator Nesbitt, who voted for the Medicaid expansion, saying we need to accept the federal money. <laughs> now this, that's the Heisman Trophy right there. I'm not that much of a sports guy, but even I know that. And these are the representatives. Uh, Tim Moffat, Nathan Ramsey, Ralph Heiss, and Apodaca, who are from the surrounding area, who said, no, we don't want that money. And I put their phone numbers up there in case anybody <laughs> wants to call them and, and give them a piece, if they're in their district, and give them a piece of their mind. Um, so this is what we're going to be doing around the state, what, we're, what we at the Justice Center are already starting to do. We're going to go to every district we can and we're going to show that picture of everybody grinning about denying all that federal money to expand health coverage. And we're going to show people how their representatives voted. And you know what? It's not really hard, unfortunately, to figure out how your representative voted. Because I hate to say it, but every single Republican voted to deny and not accept the federal money for Medicaid, and every single Democrat voted for it. And that was a real surprise to us because we were talking to a lot of Republicans in the weeks leading up to the vote who said, you know, I think that's not a bad idea to expand the Medicaid program. I think it's probably a good thing to do for our hospitals and our poor people, like Governor Chris Christie in New Jersey, like Rick Scott in Florida, you know, like Susan Martinez in New Mexico, all Republicans who are saying we should expand Medicaid. Yes, yes, Amber in Arizona, the, the list goes on. So I, the, the politics are not good, I think. Um, there's a lot of Republicans who are for this. Uh, they didn't vote for, for this expansion. Now, that's one part of what I'm going to tell you. The other part is, and I'll just end with this so we have plenty of time. What, why in the world, when you call these folks up and say, why in the world did you vote to reject that federal money? Why are they going to, what are they going to say? I mean, it's so, you know, it's just sort of unbelievable. Um, well, the reasons are given, the main one is, well, the Medicaid system is broken. And I loved um, that Dr. Dowler was talking about Medicaid um, being a model system in North Carolina, because it really is. And 
this is one of the most troubling arguments to me as a public health professional because we, all of our community health centers and all of our hospitals and all of our pediatric practices and family um, physicians and every other provider have worked very, very hard together for 20 years to put together probably what many people acknowledge is one of the best Medicaid systems in the country. We are delivering fantastic care. And it's not that there's, you know, there, there are more benefits because you've got people who are elderly and who, you know, need enormous amounts of services or have really serious disabilities. But they really coordinate the services really well. And so once people say Medicaid is broken, I'm thinking you don't know much about North Carolina. So what I did was I made this little video. I'm going to show it to you. Um, because amazingly, Governor Pat McCrory, he's saying his main reason for not expanding Medicaid is that the system's broken. And so I was trying to figure out where he got that idea. several reasons. One is our current Medicaid system in North Carolina is broken. The system of delivery. Now where did he get that idea? Our, we have one of the best Medicaid systems in the country. Why is he saying it's broken? Is he really thinking for himself or is this just some talking point he got from somewhere? It's those new innovative ways of what Republican governors are looking at across the country before we expand a broken system. Instead of expanding a broken program, we will continue working together to implement real health solutions for South Carolina. Well, it's a broken system. It's a totally broken system right now, and uh, it is not working well. Uh, not only in Alabama, it's not working well anywhere. The bottom line here is that Medicaid uh, is a failed program. What we're saying is put 16, 17 million more people in a Medicaid, a program that's already broken, that's already antiquated, doesn't make a lot of sense. All right. So, obviously, uh, our governor and a lot of the legislators got some little sheet from the people who don't want to expand Medicaid co group that says, here's, here's what you say. Medicaid is broken. So, you know, it just it sort of boggles the mind. I guess that works in all of it. By the way, all those states are not expanding Medicaid. In states that are expanding Medicaid, like or the, where the governor wants to expand Medicaid, like Rick Scott in Florida or Chris Christie in, in, uh, in New Jersey, they're not saying it's broken. So now what about, what about our Medicaid system? You know, is it just me saying that it's a great system or Dr. Dower saying it's a great system? Let's see what else is happening with it. <laughs> In North Carolina, they have created a community-based health care system for Medicaid patients that may be a model for the rest of the nation. I was the Medicaid director in Alabama for 10 years, and they're now going through the process that they had two committees to look at Medicaid reform, a legislative committee and a gubernatorial committee. Both committees said, we need to look at the North Carolina model and go forward with that. And, and there are states all across the country that are looking at that. If you look in the last 07 to 10, actual growth in Medicaid and the actual program itself, get down to the core program, the average for the four years is 3.5%. That's the lowest of any place in the nation. So Alright. So, I will... That's all I got to show you. I don't have any more numbers. But, I, this is a winnable fight. Okay, this is winnable. There are lots of states that are expanding this coverage. It doesn't matter whether they're Republicans or Democrats. We can do this. And we will do it. It is one of the clearest examples of a black and white health policy issue I've ever seen in my entire career. There is no reason that we should not expand our award-winning, non-broken system. And if all of us calls our own legislators and keeps reminding them of this, 
That is going to happen. It may not happen this year. It could. They could decide to change their minds. I think it definitely will happen next year. So, every day. So, thank you very much. Anyone who would like to comment or who has a question for the panelists, please step forward. Uh, in the middle of the room, you will see a microphone. Um, yes, right there. And um, if you will just let us know your name, if you're affiliated with any organization. Um, for right now, we want to be conscious of time, so if we could limit it to either one question or comment to start with, just to make sure everyone who'd like to um, has an opportunity to participate. Okay. Um, Thank you. This is why you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm Leslie Boyd. I'm the president of Western North Carolina Health Advocates. It was founded in memory of my son who died because he didn't have $2,300 cash to pay in advance for colonoscopies every year. So when you said $1,000, well, $2,300 cash, no check, and he died. Um, we're having, my organization is sponsoring a rally tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. at Pritchard Park downtown. and. It's because we know that if Medicaid expansion is approved before the end of June, North Carolina won't lose a penny of this <coughs> billions of dollars. So if you would please come out tomorrow, 5.30, Pritchard Park. We want a lot of people because we want to be able to take some photos and send them to Nathan Ramsey and Tim Moffat and Tom Apodaca and Ralph Heiss and say, you're not going to get these votes if you don't do the right thing. So please come out tomorrow. Thanks. Uh, good evening. Well, I, we're going to talk about next steps, too. Feel free to come up to the microphone. But I want to make sure that we all, before we leave, kind of have a sense of where locally we're headed in terms of our response over the next many months and in coordination with folks um, that are closer to Raleigh. And so finding a mechanism for doing that, I think, is critical. So I want to make sure everybody, if you're interested, has signed in and put all your contact information, because um, we at WinCap will take the next step of doing a mass email to everybody who uh, came tonight and organize some kind of working group. And um, we'll decide what our agenda is together as a, as a group and make sure we're in touch with the Justice Center and, and uh, the Duke Project and uh, Allison and, and everybody. So um, make sure you signed in, okay? Thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm Susan Wilson. I'm a local attorney. I think one other aspect that we can use as a talking point is the fact that we are losing thousands of jobs that would have come in if we'd gotten that billion dollars. Um, McCrory, in one of his smiley pictures, was very proud of himself for bringing, I think it was 2,500 jobs uh, to the Charlotte area. Um, because MetLife Insurance was expanding its office there. Well, 2,500 jobs pales in comparison to the jobs that we will lose just this year. And that doesn't include what's going to happen in 2016 when the federal money drops off. and we're already hemorrhaging a lot in the mental health field. We don't need for it to go any worse in any other. That's a great point. I think the estimates around 23,000 jobs would have come in with Medicaid expansion. But another one of the threats we're facing is this outsourcing of Medicaid um, within the government. And in, in fact, Medicaid, North Carolina Medicaid programs outsourced to a managed care organization, which will almost be from out of state then we're going to lose thousands and thousands more jobs because of our homegrown Medicaid program has grown so large. Hi, my name is Lynn Beach of Stinson. Um, it seems like a lot of the broken, broken system is based on this state auditor's report on the Medicare system. Could someone talk about that? OK, what, what you're referring to is, um, before we got into all this debate, the state auditor came out with this report that said, you know, Medicaid is spending more money than the legislature said it should. Um, there's a couple problems with that. The first is, nothing, there's nothing in that report, and we are actually investing, looking, tearing, we're, we're looking closely at that report because we think there are some pretty big problems with it. But 
Um, the first thing is, no one is saying that money in the Met North Carolina Medicaid program was spent on anything except taking care of poor kids, you know, sick adults, um, people with disabilities. No one's saying that money went to, the auditor is not saying that money went to, um, you know, buy limousines for you know, people to go to the doctor in. That's, there's nothing in there about that. The second thing is, is that the it, people tend to forget, and the state auditor forgot, and which I reminded the legislators, but they were not as impressed by, that um, a year and a half ago, the then DHHS secretary, former Republican legislator Lanier Kanzler, told the the state legislature and the leaders putting together the budget that the cuts they were asking him to make were unrealistic and unattainable. His words, not mine. He even wrote that in a letter to the legislative leadership. He said it repeatedly in every news outlet he could name. So then to come back a year and a half later and say, oh, you didn't make the budget targets that the legislature set is ridiculous. Um, the other claim in that audit report is, oh, North Carolina has higher administrative costs than, than, others, than all these, these 10 other states we just happened to pick. Well, you know what? I looked at those 10 other states, and every one of those states has the majority of their Medicaid patients in private managed care systems. So, of course, they, they don't have very much administrative costs because they're farming it out to all these private out-of-state companies. In North Carolina, we don't do that. We keep our Medicaid patients, we do our own managed care. And so we keep our money in-house. So when you add in the private system costs to these other states, they have double or triple our administrative costs. So those are points we're going to be making as we go forward. I think that audit report has serious problems. I, you don't have to look any farther. There's, anybody says to you, audit report, Medicaid, spending out of control, that the one statistic that you can remember is, and I put it in that, in that because Nelson Dollar, who's a Republican from Wake County, said it a couple weeks or last month, we have the lowest spending growth in our Medicaid program in the entire nation. Okay? That's in the, from statehealthfacts.org, the big, biggest compilation of state, you know, it's nonpartisan, doesn't have anything to do with anybody, it's just laying out the Medicaid spending growth. That's just a fact. Okay? So anybody says audit report, everything's out, we have the lowest spending growth in the nation. We're doing something right. Hey, I'm Hoyt Ponder. I'm a Democrat living here in Nashville. Uh, I just have a simple question. Uh, where does the $1.4 billion come from? Come on, that's an easy easy question for you. It's our money. It's, just, it's our money, money that's, that comes out of our pockets. And it's the North Carolina taxpayers. Absolutely. We're giving it away. We're give, it's our money from our federal taxes. It's not come. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah, it's... It's not coming out, the, and it's it's actually it's also coming out of our hospitals, our nonprofit hospitals, and our nonprofit community health centers because they're getting less money, they're getting cut to pay for the Affordable Care Act. And the idea was we you know we're asking people who make over two hundred thousand dollars a year to pay a little more in taxes. They're paying more in taxes in North Carolina. We're asking our hospitals and health centers to take less. We're, we're making changes in Medicare so that the hospitals actually get paid less than Medicare providers. That's our money. And we're going to be sending it to New Jersey or Arizona. That's what. That's not my words. That's what um, Jan Brewer said in Arizona. We're going, we're going to be sending our money to you know, other states if we don't expand Medicaid. Hi, I'm Cam Award with the Buncombe County Democratic Party. And I want to say that history of Medicaid started out kind of the same way, the original old Medicaid. There were Republican states who rejected it, but now what's happened? Ever since we've known, every state has had Medicaid. We are going to get Medicaid here. It's our duty to press as hard as we can to get it as fast as we can, because it's going to happen. So it's a hopeful thing, let's do it. And then the question I had was, in my research, I haven't been able to find out the transition point from when your 
you're in the Medicaid zone, you're not able to qualify to the subsidy part for the 100% in poverty level. How do they do that? Like, when you're on social services, you have to go back to the social services place every month to qualify to get services. So how does that work? I don't understand what's going to happen. Um, so they, the expanded Medicaid and the subsidies the, the eligibility determination is done through this online process, and so every there'll be re-enrollment, re and they'll be able to go out and, and get the income information, um, and it'll be based on t on what people filed for their ta previous year's taxes for for these subsidies anyway. The med not not for the Medicaid because most of the many of those folks, well, the ones that aren't filing taxes, um, won't that won't be done. And Medicaid, but for folks getting subsidies, there's they will be looking at their taxes. So one important thing is if you know folks that might want to um, apply for insurance and get subsidies, it'll be a lot easier if they file their taxes this year. And that's and that's a yearly certification process, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, and it's a yearly. It's yearly, and the subsidies are determined based on the previous year's income. And then when people file taxes, there'll be a process of, of re reconciliation. And they'll just make an adjustment if people got too much or not enough subsidy. Um, my name is Terry Van Dyne, and I'm um, chair of an advocacy committee with Women for Women, um, a funding circle in um, Western North Carolina. And so I've had a little bit of experience with lobbying to the majority in the state legislature, and I have found them to be um, a very dismissive. Um, extraordinarily dismissive and um, so I happened to see uh, Joe Sam Queen recently and I asked him how is it that we can move the um, move the needle on this uh, given that they are not going to listen to us and his suggestion was and I don't know how to do this his suggestion was that if we could mobilize the churches and it would seem to me that this would be a natural for the churches to want to provide for the neediest in their community basic health care. Um, but I don't know how to do this, but I would be, I do not want to an organized church, but I would be um, more than happy to work with folks on, 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 on mobilizing churches. If, I think it's a great idea. Uh, we work with churches quite a bit and um, have in the past, and we'll, I think it's a fantastic idea. And we'll, we'll be happy to work more with you. If you do that. Isn't, my name is Peter Bodds, and I'm a citizen. Isn't this disastrous for hospitals in North Carolina? Don't they, don't they stand to lose millions and millions of dollars? And isn't this why Rick Scott changed his mind and uh, agreed to accept? Absolutely, particularly our rural um, hospital and our critical access hospitals will be devastated by this. Our larger hospitals in cities um, will have enough of a payer mix that they'll survive it, but I suspect for our rural hospitals this really could, could decimate them. Do you have any other questions? Um, my name is Robin Jones. I'm an RN. I work for Mission Health. I'm the uh, program coordinator for the stroke program. And just in response to that, in terms of how this can uh, impact um, not only the critical access hospitals in our region and across our state, but it's a direct impact to patients and families. Um, you know, because when services are no longer available in your local community, you have to travel long distances to get to that medical center. And the medical center is a finite resource. We only have so many beds. And what I fear is that A, patients won't have access to care. B, if they do have access to care, they're going to get here, and they're going to be here a long time before we can get them back home. Because when you can't just be discharged from a hospital without having a community you know, practice physician to go back to. You need to have something in your home community. So I think um, it could be a, again, back to your patient stories going to have individual impact. Um, and the, the local hospitals, um, if they reduce their resources, they reduce their, someone else mentioned this, but it, you know, those, those are jobs lost. Um, 
their health care is probably one of the number one employers in North Carolina. But if there's no one there to provide the care, there's no one getting the job, it's going to have a huge trickle down effect. I came here this evening despairing at this whole issue and, and the sheer irrationality of what's been going on. And I just want to say that the caliber of people that we've had in front of us this evening, if you are the examples of what, of where the solution's coming from, then I am no longer despairing. Thank you. Today, today is Einstein's birthday. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, touching back on uh, Peter, what Peter said about the hospitals and uh, what Terry said about uh, the legislators being very dismissive of um, people coming in and lobbying or whatever. Uh, since that, since you know, individuals don't seem to be uh, the, the loss of a vote doesn't seem to be a threat enough to people. What's happening with and community mobilization? doesn't seem to, I mean, I'm glad we're all here, I'm glad we're all doing this, but what about mobilization uh, of uh, people behind private hospitals, the people who are board of directors and touching on the hospital thing, it, it's not just the nonprofit hospitals that are gonna be affected by this. So what's going on with the mobilization of the people who have the reins in that respect, in the private sector and in also in the nonprofit hospital area? Well. Uh, we definitely are, when our plan is to talk to hospitals in every community where we go to the, the Justice Center because we think that they play an important role. Um, we can't do, I think, you know, we, the hospital association has to really make the, the determinations, the association of all the hospitals in the state. But I wouldn't, you know what I would say, I would not discount our ability to change, turn this around. Because we, I cannot tell you, we really, I wasn't just talking off the cuff. We, there were a lot of Republicans we talked to who had gotten the message about it's a good thing to expand Medicaid. So now just let me, let me finish this. So the, the way the politics worked is that, um, that the, uh, the Tom Tillis you know, and the, um, Phil Berger, President Pro Tem of the Senate, Tom Tillis, Speaker of the House, both want to run for Kay Hagan's Senate seat in a year and a half. They want to run for her Senate seat. They want to take it away. And the other person who would like to run is a congresswoman from down near my way who took Bob Etheridge's seat. Her name's Renee Elmers. Now, they're all Republicans. They want to run for that seat. And they're all trying to out, out conservative, out Tea Party, the other one, because they got to run in the primary. So they all jumped on this. We're the, I'm the biggest no Medicaid, no Obamacare guy. Now, when you're the leader of the House and the leader of the Senate, then they got together their, the Republicans in their caucus and said, I don't care what you guys have been saying about or thinking that you might want to expand Medicaid. You're not doing it because I want to, you know, we can't have that. I've got to be strong, seem strong um, as being the biggest no Obamacare guy. Now, the only way that's going to change is if even Governor McCrory, I think he wanted to expand Medicaid, but he got you know, one up by these by the folks in the legislature. Now he's now I think he was a weak guy that he didn't anticipate this and think that this might be an issue. I mean, anybody with half a brain would have could have figured that one out. I hate to say it, but um, the politics are not that hard to understand. If we can get enough of those Republicans who are thinking this might not be a bad idea, I don't want a bunch of people in my district coming to me saying, "Why the heck didn't you take this federal money?" then they're going to, if enough of them get mad at Berger and Tillis and say, I'm not going to shortchange people in my district because you want to go ahead and beat everybody in the Republican primary for Kay Hagan's seat. I don't care about that. I care about the people in my district. So I, it is totally politically doable. We already had Republicans who, who wanted to do this. I think if we had six more months, we probably would have got it. And, and also, I'll say, I was actually, I just serendipitously ended up um, at the committee hearing 
where this was brought up and was sort of shocked with the speed that this became a, an issue. I don't think anyone had any idea this issue. This was a train coming out of the station and there was nothing that was going to stop it. I think now we've just got to go back and do some work. We also have an overwhelmingly inexperienced legislature. We have the highest number of freshmen um, representatives and senators than we've ever had. And so I think it was an, an environment where you had a lot of inexperienced folks getting pushed pretty hard by more experienced people. And so I do think there's a great amount of hope that we can turn this around. I think there was nothing to do initially. I will say though that I know the Hospital Association did come out in opposition to this. And the House of Medicine actually came together and a letter was written um, from the House of Medicine um, representing all the specialties saying, we really support you know, responsible Medicaid expansion. And so th that did happen early on, but this train was just coming out of the station and no one was gonna stop it initially. Okay, so I mean, do we do it all again? Yeah, do we have to do it all again? Yeah. Is there a way to mobilize the community to, I mean, I'm just trying to think of, of ways to really, I mean, look at donor files, see who's on board, see who, you know, who's connected to particular campaigns, who's connected to particular uh, aspects of, I, I know, it's, it's frustrating as an un, uninsured person under 26 whose parents happen to be over 65, there, you know, yeah. there's a loophole there that I don't get insured, that I may, I'm just not poor enough that I can't get Medicaid, all kinds of frustrating factors. And yeah, I'm not ready to have kids, so I'm not gonna, you know, go get pregnant just you know, just to get Medicaid, all kinds of factors. But uh, yeah, I'm glad we're all here and uh, we can mobilize to take some action to turn this around. Yes, and thank you so much for your thoughtful comments and questions this evening. Um, I think we are going to go ahead and wrap up and I'll turn the podium over to Jeff for some closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I want to make sure we don't leave without thanking Peggy Wheel, who has worked with We've got staff and volunteers to help pull this off, and all of our partners. There's a lot of nonprofits that um, came in on this together. And so the key here is the follow-up, as you were saying. So look for an email to be from wincap.org. So we can organize some kind of working group and strategize, bringing in churches and other partners. Whatever that strategy turns out, turns out to be, we'll help get the ball rolling with our limited staff. So we're all going to have to pitch in. And I definitely want to thank all the panelists. You guys were phenomenal. Thank you, Jacqueline, for facilitating and moderating. It's great. Um, and thank you all for your energy and interest. So we'll keep it up. Let's be optimistic. We've got some, some uh, hard work ahead of us, but it sounds like we can, we can change this. So thank you.